you are an engineer highly respected engineer in your field okay with that being said what ends up happening is that you end up through a handful of different contacts resources projects allocations you know uh, funds you, you name it uh it, meetings and, and what have you you end up being given access to some very very sensitive and classified material pertaining to extraterrestrials now what i mean by that is this you are taken into a deep underground military base as an engineer by the way one of the most highly respected in your field and uh, you're approaching a aesthetically a very beautiful woman and you just think okay you know i, I wonder what's going on here in the, in the sense that I, something feels off when you look at her there's a human structure she's bipedal she's humanoid but something feels very off and to be quite honest the first thing you think to yourself is she's a little bit too aesthetically beautiful or angelic if you want to call it to be human really now what ends up happening is your superior says okay all of your um uh, projects will now be uh surveilled and supervised by this particular individual right here this woman now you end up meeting a mathematician in this same base this same facility this woman says please come with come with me it's you an engineer and a mathematician who you just met she takes you to a room a very gray room you know you don't think much of it and she starts to undress uh, no no word of a lie she starts to undress she then lies down on the seeming what looks to be a mattress uh, at the back end of the room she says okay try and get to me by only covering half of the each of you can only cover half of the distance and if you can do this you'll you can sleep with me now you being the engineer you start to think you're a little bit quiet for a little bit but the mathematician does the math in his head already the calculations he goes there's no point because i'm never going to reach you right but the engineer you you start to say you know what I may not be able to get to her, but I can get close enough for practical reasons. Now, the reason I give this example, which by the way, thank you so much, Scott, for this example. I know I sort of changed it to adjust a little bit, but I really appreciate it, is to showcase that the space between you, the engineer, and this woman, or this ET, whatever you want to call it, you cannot get there with how you measure distance relative to our understanding of space and time. But what if there are certain elements within the electromagnetic spectrum that we cannot understand, yet alone sense? Okay, that could actually get us there to this woman. Now, again, this is just a metaphorical example, but the idea here being that we cannot see certain electromagnetic frequencies above or below a certain resonant sound and certain resonant space-time laser continuum, if you want to call it that. Now, before we do that, I just want to say that we do have a Patreon. It does uh, absolutely help support the show. Again, we have $4, $8, $12 uh, US, depending whichever package you prefer. We have everything from early release episodes. You see episodes days, sometimes weeks before they come out. Uh, we have members-only episodes, the one-on-one -on -one and group Zoom calls. You get access to all of our uh, dark web archives, data, you name it. So many other things as well. With that being said, today's episode is called Project Red Sun. Mining ICC loop pool minerals to activate cerebral tachyons and in brackets, fusion paradoxes. Now, first off, let's understand what Project Red Sun was, okay? Now, we're going to reference back and go full circle with the example I gave earlier very shortly. According to Anomalian.com, great website, by the way. Project Red Sun, NASA's top secret manned mission to Mars. As many believe, NASA secretly financed and backed an Apollo-type project, which was named Project Red Sun, and it intended to send astronauts to colonize the Red Planet. So how much do we actually know about Mars? Now, according to Sulask.com, numerous sources reveal that Mars was a really big deal for the U.S. space-based agency ever since the 1950s. The Apollo sequence of events was finishing up, and the whole world was left bewildered because of this enormous progress. However, no one was aware that NASA was cooking up something bigger. Presumably in the 1970s, NASA pointed its focus towards a possible manned mission to the Red Planet. Even though this sounds way too far-fetched, in the end, it may end up to be true due to numerous reasons. First of all, 50 years ago, Mariner 4 was the first attempted mission to get near Mars's surface. Mariner 4 was the fourth in a series of spacecraft intended for planetary exploration in a flyby mode. It was designed to conduct close scientific observations of Mars and to transmit these observations to Earth. Launched on November 28, 1964, Mariner 4 performed the first successful flyby of the planet Mars, returning the first close-up pictures of the Martian surface. It captured the first images of another planet ever returned from deep space. Their depiction of a crater dead planet largely changed the scientific community's view of life on Mars. Now, here's what's interesting 
okay? Apparently, what they discovered made them con convey the so-called Project Red Sun. Their purpose seemingly was to settle the Red Planet. Their reasons, did they think there was uh, some sort of extraterrestrial life there? Here's what's interesting as well, too. In 1971, one year prior to the last Apollo mission, Mariner 9 was orbiting Mars. It was able to snap its total surface, therefore giving certain pictures that showed old riverbeds, a 3,000 mile long Grand Canyon, huge volcanoes, and additional artificial-like formations. Take a look at the picture right here, folks. Mariner 9 view of the Noctis Labyrinthus or Labyrinth at the western end of Valles Marineris. Regarding all these facts uh, we mentioned, we can't help but ask the inev inevitable. What happened between 1970 and 1976? Why didn't NASA openly speak they landed a craft on the surface until then? Okay, the idea here, if we take a look at a compilation of videos and images, if you will, we will find, and I quote, I introduced to you a press release testimony I've written to discuss the presumed existence of a hush-hush military space program called Project Red Sun, carried out in the 70s of the last century to build a stationary base on Mars, the Red Planet. End quote. Now, this was said by Italian journalist and UFO researcher Luca Scantamburlo, who testified giving details about Red Sun in a press conference. He also gave some documents to credit this as, as well, in addition to an image right here which shows astronauts on Mars allegedly. Okay, now, this, w this allegedly is Buzz Aldrin on the surface of Mars in the year 1970. End quote. Now, interestingly enough, Buzz, Al Al Buzz Aldrin, excuse me, has started to speak about monoliths on Mars, even on the moon and things like that. There's certain things he's kind of let slip, but but it seems like he's sort of coloring and staying within the lines, metaphorically, so to speak, with respects to the individuals that have given him permission and privy to disseminate some of this information. Now, you might be saying, Dave, what's the point of this? Why do you bring this up? Well, for the members who know, some of that footage, allegedly from the uh, late 70s, early 80s, of the hexagon sort of honeycomb structured bases on the backside of Mars that was filmed in correspondence with a human alien extraterrestrial program. What's interesting is that we'll find the Nazis, or the Nachtwaffen, if you will, they are the Dark Fleet, the Night Weapon, whatever you want to call it, allegedly established a deep underground military base on Mars relative to a deal made with the Reptilians and the Dracos with some Orion Greys serving underneath of the Dracos. How do we know this? If we take a look at en.swene.cz, what we see here is that Take a look, and I quote, this is according to Grigorovich Ivashov, again, Leonid Ivashov, quote, there is evidence that large German settlements were established in Latin America as well, and around Antarctica, virtually all the islands were German colonies. Yuri Ivanovich Grigorovich Ivashov, uh, excuse me, <laughs> Yuri Ivanovich Drostov, our legal intelligence officer, writes in his memoirs how he swore allegiance to the Fuhrer. He was our Soviet resident in Latin America, but he joined the Nazi group sometime in 1948 in the XNUMXs when he was already uh, New Germany. He looked like an SS man and was forced to publish that he swore to the Fuhrer. And he emphasized that he's alive and that you'll find out soon enough. End quote. Now, the reason I, I bring this up so significantly and so strongly is because we need to understand the cerebral tachyons, okay? Now, let's take a look at this right over here. Astro astronomytrek.com. Five bizarre paradoxes of time travel explained. Closed casual loops, such, such as the predestination paradox and the bootstrap paradox, which involve a self-existing time loop in which cause and effect run in a repeating circle, but is also internally consistent with the timeline's history. Okay, now, again, we look here at predestination paradox. It occurs when the actions of a person traveling back in time becomes part of past events and may ultimately cause the events he is trying to prevent to take place. This results in a temporal casuality loop in which event one in the past influences event two in the future which then causes event one to occur with this circular loop of events ensuring that history is not altered by the time traveler. This paradox suggests that things are always destined to turn out the same way and that whatever has happened must happen, end quote. Now, there's the bootstrap paradox, which is, again, a quote, I quote, a type of paradox in which an object, person, or piece of information sent back in time results in an infinite loop where the object has no discernible origin and exists without ever being created. It is also known as ontological paradox, as ontology is a branch of philosophy concerned with the nature of being or existence, end quote. Now, the bootstrap paradox seems to be substantiated by the alleged fact of, you know, the infinity symbol with relative to that of crop circles and depictions within uh, languages and symbolism in Project Carrot, relative to the, to the description that all these whistleblowers have discussed when they've asked certain extraterrestrials about how they perceive time. It exists, but it does not. It is, it is but it isn't. You see what I'm saying now? If we take a look here at the uh, Let's Kill Hitler paradox, uh, Polchinski's paradox, uh, 
we take a look, for example, at the grandfather paradox. I'm not going to go through all of them. The idea is this. What happens if you insert through the inverted mechanism of a holographic substrate, a pocket dimension that merges through the essence of time-space manipulation, not breaking it, but ma manipulating and bending it to combine all of these paradoxes into one. Okay. Now, here's what's equally as interesting, because if we take a look at this document right over here, and this is a uh, this is from the book Time Traveler and the Infernal Base from the Future dimension. This is page number 25 at the Smithsonian Institution, Department of Ancient Artifacts, Washington, D.C. And I quote, inside a very large and rectangular room, which is part of the Department of Artifacts of Ancient Civilizations and History of the Smithsonian Institution, where ancient cuneiform clay tablets and slabs from the Middle East and the Near East are deciphered, translated and studied. But again, this is in a classified setting. Keep in mind, by the way, folks, this sort of pertains to yesterday's previous public episode. And for the members that came out a handful of days ago as an early release pertaining to alcohol me and using sacred science. Now, take a look at this right over here. Dr. Robert Hutton, a noted historian and an expert linguist, ancient Semitic dead languages, is seated behind a desk and examining a large cuneiform clay tablet. Okay. On the desk, piles of papers and scriptures in English and in an, an unknown archaic language obstruct his view. Dr. Melvina Positano, assistant curator, approaches Dr. Hutton and she says, so what do you think, Bob? Dr. Rob, Robert Hutton says, think about what? She says, the slab you are translating for the Air Force and the CIA. D the doctor says they're not going to believe it. Dr. Melvina says, do you believe it? What's so important about that particular one? You've translated dozens of tablets, if not more. Doc the doctor, uh, Robert uh, Hutton says, 10,000 year old Melvina. Yeah, I believe it. Yes, I do. Compared the text, I compared the text with Akkadian, Phoenician, and Ugaritic. They all match. Even the MT tablet at the Vatican matches Anak. Dr. Melvina Positano asks, so this Anak is really the language of the extraterrestrials? Is this the language you are working on at the Library of the Vatican? Dr. Robert Hutton says, yep, the language of the Anunnaki who created us genetically some 65,000 years ago. Who told you I worked at the Library of the Vatican? Dr. Melvina says, you know people talk, Bob. How long it took you to learn Anak? And Dr. Robert says, a few weeks. Dr. Melvina says, come on, impossible, really? So it is true then what I've heard about you. Dr. Robert Hutton says, heard what? What did you hear? Dr. Melvina says, well, I heard that you are not 100% human, and all those supernatural powers of yours must have something to do with it, right? Is it true, Bob? Dr. Robert Hutton smiling, no answer. Dr. Melvina asks, how did you learn the ET's language in one week? Where did you study it? Who taught you, Bob? Dr. Robert says, use your imagination. Dr. Melvina says, the Anunnaki, where did they come from? Dr. Robert Hutton says, Ashtari. Dr. Melvina says, Ashtari, where is that? And Dr. Robert says, Ashtari is an Aldebaran Melvina, the brightest star in the Hades, or Hades, if you want to call it. It is a giant red star in the constellation of Taurus. It is also called Alpha Tauri, one of the 15 brightest stars with a visual magnitude of 0 0.85. And as a side note, end quote, in 1972, NASA sent a message to Alpha Tauri and another one from Pioneer 10. Here's what's interesting as well, too. Dr. Melvina, of course, the Nazi and Maria Orsa claimed to have received from the extraterrestrials in Alpha Tauri technical data to build their first UFO. What did they call it? The Vril? Again, Dr. Robert Hutton says, the Giants flug maskin, the Vril flug scheiben. Uh, pardon me if I... Uh, if I, uh, end quote, if I butchered that, that pronunciation there, the point is this folks, what we're going to notice is the preservation of certain stars, planets, exoplanets, you name it, pertaining to the color red is more than just simply a color. The color in which emits based off of the soil and composition of certain planets and exoplanets emits a particular frequency in which must be contained due to the fact that certain frequencies, ones that are emitted and uh, are being emitted from Venus, ones that are being emitted from Mars in a very ancient, uh, esoteric prehistoric way due to the amount of damage that was done on Mars relative to CIA remote viewing documents and all that describes the way in which there are certain cerebral tachyons to mess with and conflate if you want to call it different timelines why do I say that well ICC stands for interplanetary uh, interplanetary corporate conglomerates Lockheed Martin Raytheon these are human run corporations that are mining on the moon on Venus on Saturn they're using slave labor in order to continue this mining operation and it is also being done by the way if you take it's also being done in antarctica in antarctica right and we're going to notice as well too that if we take a look for example at this right over here dailystar.co.uk heat map uncovers secret underground government base in antarctica a mysterious heat map has revealed a top secret multi-level government base hidden beneath antarctica and if we take a look over here popularmechanics.com u.s troops accidentally reveal secret bases by going jogging and quote 
For those that know this, it's a bit of a giggle, it's about a one to two year old story, but for those that don't know, folks, they wore their Fitbits in Antarctica in these underground bases. We're putting up the images now. You gotta see, not just in Antarctica, but underneath the water in large, vast amounts of the oceans, and you could see them going in a circle. Now, it's been presumed on the public level that they were going jogging, but it's, again, it's quite more substantial to prove that we can actually suggest these are humans working within that of slave labor facilities in these deep underground military bases. Why do I say that? Take a look at news.mit. MIT.edu. This is from 2014. This could also be applied to something else that's going on in the world right now, but I don't want to say it for the sake of, you know, getting banned instantly. But magnetic neural control with nanoparticles. Customized arrays of iron oxide nanoparticles are possible based on their different uh, differing responses to alter alternating magnetic fields, MIT researchers report. Take a look at this, and I quote, Magnetic nanoparticles don't have to be one size fits all. Instead, individual magnetic particles can be tailored in an array of different sizing and compositions to allow for heating them separately by varying the frequency and amplitude of an external external alternating magnetic field end quote why is this brought up these chips were inserted into the soldiers many many years ago similar to how they give you know the tetanus shots the polio shot like when you come in they have the, the to the military they have the the guns that just shoot all those needles into you i'm not saying this happened to every soldier i'm not trying to say this as if it's fact i'm speaking relative to that of the 20 and back secret space program why do i say that because if we take a look over here this is space.com. SETI evolution. Searching for aliens using whale songs and radios. Interestingly enough, part of Project A119, A119, to bring a nuke to the moon and explode it to show off to the Soviets and what have you, was destroyed on the way to the moon with from a UFO that came and shot a bunch of laser beams at it, and then the, the nuke, or the missile, just quietly disassembled and fell into the ocean of the Earth's, uh, uh into the Earth's ocean. Now, a lot of you know this, right? We can also argue, too, that Project Starfish Prime was also a significant revelation of this. But the reason I say that is because there were certain frequencies that, be that were being emitted. We don't know if biological, natural or not, or if it came from the simulation of the universe, you name it, that were encircling this nuke that fell into the water of Earth. And it seemed like whales were circulating it. Interestingly enough, dolphins, whales, whale songs, and dolphin forms of communication seem to be that of certain frequential energy contours that could be tuned into the not just the human brain, but any brain of consciousness, okay? And the reason we know that is because if we take a look at this right here, NPR.org, this came out just a couple days ago. A gene editing experiment let these patients with vision loss see color again. All right, now this is using DARPA's CRISPR gene editing, that whole thing with RNA, you name it. But again, I have to be very careful, relative and respective of that. However, what we're also going to find here too is that if we take a look at this right over here, nordicmonitor.com, leaked intelligence report confirms Russia monitored Erdogan's family's illegal businesses. You might be saying, Dave, whoa, what is this? What is Russia, Turkey? What does it have to do with this? Well, certain Turkish businessmen own the patents and own the rights to certain gene modification CRISPR editing, which seems to be a deliberate intelligence operation by DARPA, in addition to advanced team six in correspondence with certain individuals at the uh, department of uh, sorry defense intelligence agency and the cia the central intelligence agency to use cerebral tachyons to influence different forms of timelines that will create structures and i guess you could say uh, uh, energetic constructs that will allow for the elite's timeline to continue to be pursued how do we know that well if we take a look at bloomberg.com let's see here very quickly BOFA, Bank of America outage, shuts out thousands online, service now restored, because again, it was, it was updated, but at the time that the article was reported, there was a shortage. These small moments of crisis, cr crises, if you want to call it, allow for cerebral tachyons to energetically infuse the minerals that have been mined from the moon, from Jupiter, from Mars, from Saturn, from Venus, by the ICC, the Interplanetary co uh, uh, Corporate Conglomerates, to create a form of nanoparticle tracking to figure out which one of us are fully human, which one of us are not, in addition to pushing their agenda forward in a way that does not disrupt the timeline relative to the mistakes that were made post 9-11 by the elites. And we can take a look, for example, at something like this over here very quickly. Ancientcode.com. Buzz Aldrin confirms seeing UFOs on the moon. Now, here's what we're going to notice too. I, and I quote, I saw this illumination that was moving with respect to the stars. We were smart enough to not say, Houston, there's a light out there following us. So technically, it becomes an unidentified flying object now. End quote. According to the exclusive on sighting and sci-fi's aliens on the moon, Neil Armstrong also switched to the, quote, medical channel. 
you know, quote unquote medical channel and spoke directly with the chief medical officer and is quoted as saying they're here. They're parked on the side of the crater. They're watching us, end quote. Now, here's the interesting thing too. This could be substantiated by Don Phillips, right? Not only that, but if we look at the Pulse.1, researchers claim pictures show excavation and unusual structures on far side of the moon. All right. And again, this was from the members of SETI. Inter and quote, interestingly enough, we're going to find that sort of general apparatus of academia being the same institution to reveal these things, understandably so, because there are certain ways in which information needs to get out. But here's the thing. When you take the pocket dimension that was initially mentioned earlier, that sort of infuses the different paradoxes relative to the pocket dimension that it's in. What you then have are cerebral tachyons that are activating the zero point field that can then interface with that of the mind, not just using uh, nanoparticles, if you will, but using different apparatuses that we create relative to Dan Winters' proposal about fractal physics and things like this. Plasma, you know, create remote using remote viewing for humans to be able to create natural events. One perfect example, not just on this planet, but we can actually create extracted events coming inward. And you'll see what I mean very shortly. LifeScience.com, 32,000 mile per hour fireball spotted soaring over North Carolina. More than 80 people reported seeing the blazing visitor from space. Okay. Now take a look at this. DailyStar.co.uk, debris from 70 years of alleged UFO crashes to be studied in new university lab machine. Interesting, isn't it? Now we're going to look at one more article right over here howandwise.com ex-cia pilot said nasa landed on mars in 1966 and its former employee saw humans there in 1979 why do we bring this up what's happening is essentially because mass consciousness is is collectively growing even at an incremental level on this planet regardless of if some are human some are hybrid aliens without even knowing it some are you know the result of experiments you name it we are indirectly and inadvertently causing, our minds are causing these asteroids, these hurricanes, these natural disasters to occur, not because we don't know what we're doing, but because subconsciously we are aware, but we are being suppressed. Now, the best example I could give is the film Get Out. If you remember the main character, when he's hypnotized, it's like he can see what his body's doing and what he's thinking, but it's like he cannot control it, right? Sort of similar to, I guess, sleep apnea, if you want to call it. It's like he's watching a TV of himself, but he cannot control anything because of the hypnotic regression he's in. That is what multiple forms of our subconsciousness are in, which is interesting because if you were to visualize it on a much larger scale and size it to scale, that would be the exact same way in which pocket dimensions using different, uh, fusing, excuse me, the different paradoxes together would actually be able to work in a visual sense, right? Now, Take a look at this right over here, npr.org. Paradox-free time travel is theoretically possible, researchers say. This only came out a few days ago. What are the odds? End quote. Why do I say that? Because you see all of a sudden how when these different paradoxes are being proposed, all of a sudden, no, 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 don't worry about these different paradoxes. We, we, we could probably do it, the, you know, with, with, without, you know, messing with the timeline and stuff. Th people do not see the underlying issue with respects to this in the sense that when mass consciousness focuses on one way that the mainstream media wants, what ends up happening is they then pull it in, pull the people into that direction. Sort of like when you have a fishing rod, you lure the fish in. But then once the fish gets to you, they don't eat the fish metaphorically. They don't leave it. They, they throw it back into the water because once the objective has been obtained, what is there to do from an energetic sense relative to what these tachyons, these cerebral tachyons are using to describe all of this. Now, the final thing I'd like to cover is this right over here. P uh, presidential UFO uh, blog .wordpress .com. The day the Navy established contacts, members will know that I did cover this, or sorry, I did post this in the Telegram chat, but on, on July 6, 1959, Robert Friend, an Air Force Major and Acting Chief of the Aero uh, Aerial Phenomenon Division, or Project Blue Book, at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, received a call from another part of the intelligence community requesting that he evaluate a discovery by naval intelligence. Three days later, Friend flew to Washington, D.C. and met with two Navy commanders and several CIA officers. They began asking Friend what he thought of UFOs. I soon learned why they were asking, Friend told Second Look. They knew the Air Force often approached sightings with a jaundiced eye, expecting witnesses to be kooks. In this case, they were the witnesses. Now, here's the interesting as well, too. Interesting thing, excuse me. These intelligence officers who had called him to Washington began to unfold what well, be me the mo well, be well may be excuse me, the most dramatic UFO events in the annals of government UFO investigations. I don't think so, but again, relative to this time period, sure. 
During the preceding month, the two Navy officers had gone to South Berwick, Maine at the request of a retired admiral to meet a woman there who claimed to be in contact with extraterrestrials. The officers met the woman and watched her enter a trance and become a communication link. The woman sat mesmerized, only her arm from the elbow down moved. It scribbled out meaningless circles, interspeared with legible letters. They spoke, uh, they spoke questions to which answers appeared within the scribbling. The answers indicated they were coming from a kind of space patrol leader named AFFA. According to the officers, so basically, long story short, folks, this woman was essentially, I guess you could say hypnotized or she was allowing these extraterrestrials or they activated her, if you will, using these cerebral tachyons, which is why I'm giving the example to, to communicate through her, which is only one way amongst many that cerebral tachyons can work. But take a look. According to the officers, a number of unverifiable answers were offered to such questions, such as what is the population of Jupiter? Among other things, AFFA said he and his men were part of an intersolar system police force investigating atomic test uh, investigating atomic tests on earth okay now but more interestingly, the Navy intelligence men posed questions incompatible with their education of technical understanding. Questions like, what is the length of Uranus's day? And what is the distance between Jupiter and the sun at Jupiter's apogee? Her answers were correct. The two incredulous investigators later reported to Friend. Now, interestingly as well too, AFFA's origin is planet Uranus. Okay, or Uranus. AFFA said he and his patrol team members were four extraterrestrials officers of the OEEV, which meant Universal Association of Planets, assigned to EU or UENZA, Orenza's meaning Project Earth, okay? It's among the more interesting interchanges later reported to friend were the following. Question, it's very interesting that we are talking with someone that we can see, but do you have, can, but can we see, have proof of your existence? The answer for, through the woman was, what kind, what kind of proof do you, can we see you or your craft? When do you want to see now? Go to the window, she says. All the intelligence people went to the window where they saw a UFO fly by. Not stationary, but it was very close to them. As they later told friend, it was saucer-shaped and brighter around the perimeter in the center, end quote. I would then very quickly like to jump to bibliothecaplates.net because, again, we're going to see here a little bit more of that transcript has leaked. Again, quote-unquote leaked, but... The questions asked after they saw the craft were, do you favor any government, religious group, or race? No, we do not. Signed, AFFA. Will there be a third world war? No. Signed, AFFA. Which, by the way, on a bit of a personal note, in a way substantiates my proposal, which is that I don't, I personally, I could be wrong, but I don't believe a nuke will ever be dropped again on this planet, at least relative to our timeline, because of the amount of alien beings, even the ones that don't like us, that know that nukes just create a, a clusterfuck, right? Or a catastrophe, not just in this, in, in this dimension, but in others. Part of my English. Are Catholics the chosen people? No, signed AFFA. Can we see a spaceship or flying saucer? When do you want to see? Okay, go to the window, yada, yada, yada. Anyways, that was basically it. Now, there's more communication that goes on through this woman with the intelligence officials having to do with their craft, things like that, and how they speak about they can be aware of people's thoughts, you name it. But the point here is these cerebral energy tachyons could be used for both good and bad purposes. Right now, the ICC is using the interplanetary corporate conglomerate uh, mineral mining processes to harness slavery testing. Uh, sorry, uh, um, relative to the testing that went on in 2014 that the article showed there with nanoparticles using electromagnetism, magnetic frequencies, again, sound waves, light waves, you name it, okay? And then if we take a look at the way in which sacred science relative to the book, uh, the, the PDF we just looked at, we analyzed with the book having to do with the tablets of the Anunnaki, doesn't surprise us that this type of energy is available. So again, folks, I know this is quite extensive, but please let me know what you think and we'll catch all of you very, very soon. Cheers.